Well, hello and welcome. I'd like to extend uh, that warm welcome from Ventura, California to today's webinar sponsored by DHL and hosted by WebAttract, the leader in thought leadership webinars. I'm Lori Dearman, executive webinar producer at WebAttract, and in just a moment, I'll be introducing our panel of thought leaders as today's webinar is about hearing from these industry experts as they share insights on how companies can better prepare to meet the complex demands of digitalized consumers and be better positioned to take competitive advantage. You'll also have uh, at the end an opportunity to have your questions answered uh, during our Ask the Experts panel session with both of our panelists today. I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to those of you who joined our first digitalization webinar last month called Smart Warehouse Practical Guide for Digital Advantage, where we talked about the emerging warehouse technologies that are set to change supply chain logistics as we know it. Now, for those of you who weren't able to join that webinar, I'd like to just give you a quick bit of context. The impact of digitalization on supply chain operations is anticipated to be nothing short of transformative. As Lisa Harrington, one of the expert speakers from that March webinar pointed out, the traditional view of warehousing and logistics as the boring behind the scenes mechanics of moving product A to B is set to change with a high tech makeover. And we're starting to see a new smarter era of warehousing. And this is really due to two things, a revolution in the nature of fulfillment and distribution, as well as a technology tidal wave associated with digitalization. And in fact, the expert consensus is that we're literally at the cusp of a fourth industrial revolution that's commonly referred to as Industry 4.0. Fueled by digital technologies, enabling standardization and improved analytics capabilities, warehousing operations will emerge as one of the most crucial battlegrounds for the long-term sustainable success of businesses across all sectors as Industry 4.0 becomes our new normal. Both today's webinar and the March webinar were conceived as a means of highlighting the results of DHL Supply Chain's late 2017 research into digitalization and the various evolving supply chain pressures such as higher costs, increasing service requirements, and heightened customer expectations, which we'll hear about today, that make the necessity for change so urgent. We provided an overview of the findings in March, so we won't go very deeply into that right now, but on a high level, it's worth noting that 82% of the 335 cross-sector supply chain professionals that were surveyed from around the world indicated that supply chain digitalization is already having a moderate to high impact on their business today. And precisely this question leads us to our first poll question for today. And we're interested in, in asking a very similar question to all of you. Where are you in adopting warehouse technology to support omni-channel fulfillment? So just curious, where are you in this journey? All right. Well, I for one find it quite interesting to see that uh, today's results very closely matches up with the results from the DHL study and and that's looks like 39 percent of you where it was uh, just about 31 percent of that study were at that um, developing one or more initiatives mark so uh, good percentage of our audience already into this uh, this journey um, looks like followed by uh, about 19% not yet pursuing, 19% early proof of concept, 16% somewhat advanced, and uh, I guess 6% they're already in that advanced category. But uh, rest assured, um, our speakers today have many interesting things to share, and I think that there will be something of interest uh, for everybody, regardless of what stage you are in this journey. And at this moment, take the opportunity to introduce our first speaker, Micah Schnell. Uh, who joined Google in 2003 and works as an industry leader together with her team of industry managers with a variety of German and international retailers. 
The special focus of her team lies on the targeted consultation around Google's marketing solutions and on the acceleration of digital transformation in all areas of retail. For this, Micah Schnell can also leverage her experience in sales management, the management of international change processes, and the market launch of new products and services. Prior to Google, Micah was responsible for event marketing, PR, and sponsorship consulting at various agencies. At this point, I will turn the mic over to you, Micah. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Laurie. And thanks also to the DHL team for inv inviting me to uh, speak to you today at this webinar. So a very warm welcome to this webinar also from my side. And today, my goal is to share some of the latest insights to everyone and with you about the consumers in the age of assistance. So let me share a guess with you. I guess that every one of us has at least one smartphone, probably not even one arm's length away while I am speaking now. So am I correct? It is very hard to believe actually, but the smartphone is just over 10 years old now. You can't really overstate the impact mobile has had on all of our lives and, of course, also on our industry and all of our markets. And this disruption, as I would call it, is by no means over. Mobile is showing no signs of fatigue. However, there's something else going on right now as well. And this is really the beginning of a new and very powerful shift. I want to welcome you, I want to welcome all of you to the age of assistance. So while mobile should already be at, at heart of your very marketing strategy, now it is actually time to talk about the challenges and also about the great opportunities that the age of assistance brings for all of us. So from our side, from the Google side, we have identified three global tech trends uh, which are prerequisites for the current business environment we are all operating in. And let me share those with you. So number one, it's the abundance of data. And what I mean is that the volume of data is rapidly increasing and it is creating many new opportunities to leverage data in many more intelligent ways than what we used to do. Number two is the full connectivity. And what I mean by that is that users across the world are becoming digitally connected at all times. And this really leads to, to a need for companies to adapt and to create value across many different devices and also many different channels. Number three, is a radically new technology that is available now. And the pace of the development in the technology is allowing companies to make giant leaps across a range of different business areas. So these three fundamentals are shaping and altering every innovation that business will encounter in the coming years. Focusing on these broad developments allow us to put bets with a certain degree of certainty to reduce the risk of complexity while keeping up with the impact that these fundamentals will have. Today, more and more aspects of our lives are powered by mobile and digital. And I guess that many of you have devices that you see on this, on this chart. So I think we all love our devices. And of course, uh, what we really love is the power that our devices give us. The power to really get exactly what we want and get this instantly and effortlessly. And I guess that we all know how impatient we get when something is not working, one of these devices is not working as we expect them to work. So we want to have our needs not just met, but we want them to be anticipated. Looking forward, we can expect this level of empowerment to further grow while technology actually gets better and better and our expectations for getting assistance will grow with it. Think about the voice assistance. 
And I know it is still very early days, but voice assistance is a great example of how technology is increasingly catering to us as unique individuals. Because what is more personal than our very own unique voice and the way how we speak? And consider how almost 70% of requests to the assistant are expressed in natural language and not the typical keywords that people type into a web search. As a result, we are dealing with consumers who are more empowered in their digital experiences than ever before. It's the super empowered consumer that has emerged. Thanks to mobile, today's consumers can get exactly what they want instantly and effortlessly. And we are all dealing with those consumers who are so much more empowered in their digital experiences than ever before. Think about the consumer that can, who can navigate life from the palm of their hands and they make decisions on the fly and get more done than ever before. They are also much more confident and capable um, than what we've experienced in the past. This is an environment that all of us as brands, as retailers or as a service providers have to keep in mind when we want to offer solutions and products for today's consumers. As I mentioned before, these are different consumers than even just a few years ago. The very nature of how they behave and what they expect from all of us has changed. So the consumer we are dealing or who we are working with today, they're actively curious, they are incredibly demanding, and they're very impatient. Let me start with curiosity. And I want to describe today's consumers now uh, in the following a bit more to you. So let's face it, we, we've all become a bit research obsessed in the past with such easy access to information. We can know everything and we want to know everything. And even if we look at ourselves, every decision that we make can be a very informed decision and we want to get that information beforehand. So let me share with you two interesting and latest Google Data Insights, which nicely reflect this observation of a curious consumer. Over the past two years, searches for the term best grew over 80% on mobile devices. Consumers are increasingly searching for all kinds of best products and all kinds of best services, and they expect to get the right the right and relevant answers to their very individual search term. This can be a product like the best tooth toothbrush to a product like the best shower curtain, best insurance company, uh, whatever you can think about, this is definitely a growing term. A second example that I want to share with you is that searches for ideas on mobile have grown by over 55% over the past two years. And this includes all kind of, kinds of searches, starting with bathroom remodeling ideas, uh, outfit ideas, graduation party ideas, home decorating ideas, anything you can think about. Users and consumers are curious and they want to be inspired. Let's move on to the second characteristic that we see. Today's consumers are also very demanding. They expect technology and brands to know what would be useful for them at this very moment and to cater to them very personally. Not only that, today's consumers expect those tailored experiences without having to reintroduce themselves as a, as a user every time they use a device or to spell out their requests. That's way too much work. So clearly this consumer is empowered with much more information, but this consumer also expects better information and experiences too. They got some pretty high standards. So the consumer is saying to all of us, show me you know me and do it right here and right now. Please also let me share with you two interesting Google Data Insights which should nicely reflect these characteristics. This is number one, and I think it's a great example. More and more people aren't even bothering to type the term near me uh, 
brief into their phone when they do a local search. Starting in early 2017, search volume for local searches without near me have outgrown uh, comparable searches that included near me. So when I'm as a consumer type Italian food or Thai food, you should just know whether I am at the shopping mall looking for a restaurant there or I am at home expecting a delivery. I shouldn't have to specify what I need and where I am right now. I actually expect my mobile phone should have this information right there. A second example that uh, nicely reflects my observation is this one. Searches uh, for what's the weather today are up 160% since 2015. So I as a consumer should not bother to type in my current location right now when using my mobile phone for this kind of research. Again, I expect my device to exactly know where I am. I do not need to reintroduce myself. And let's look at it, the impatient characteristics as well. Yes, today's consumers are willing to invest their time researching little things like you know, toothbrushes, umbrellas, shower curtains, all these kind of things. But in each moment when they are ready to find out about something, to do something and to buy something, they want to act now and they want to get it now as well. So the experience better be fast and it better be frictionless, especially on mobile. The modern consumer is more impatient and they have a right now mindset. They act with immediacy and expect to get things done immediately. That means information and that is something that is at the heart of Google obviously but this also means products and services as well. Let me share two more data points with you which should nicely reflect this observation. So the search interest for open now has more than tripled since 2015 and this is a very significant increase in search volume the second example I want to share with you is that mobile searches related to same-day shipping are emerging and have grown by 120% since 2015. So when the, the modern consumer shows those three characteristics, they have a high level of curiosity, they're very demanding, and they are actually impatient. And we we can hopefully uh, we can hopefully share that those kinds of characteristics with some of the data sets that I've that I've shared with you. So I say that the assistance and the ability to offering assistive solutions and services is really the new battle battleground for growth. I think it really offers nice opportunities for all of us to grow businesses. So what can you do as a retailer or as a brand or as a service provider? Here is our perspective, here is my perspective, how to take advantage of those great opportunities. Put the user first is number one. Number two is be assistive, be smart and be fast. And number three is make best usage of your omnichannel assets and provide an integrated service be truly omnichannel. How, can, how to do that? That's another question. And here are just a couple of tips that we want to share. So in order to put the user first, this can be done by making really best usage of the data that you have and that you collect. Understanding your users by working with the data that you have should enable you, should allow you to put users' interest first. Number two, leverage technology to become assistive, to become smart and to be fast. There are many opportunities and um, I think it's a great opportunity to make best usage of that and to test and to experiment around with it and to learn while it's still very new. Number three, it's about the integrated services that you might be able to offer because you might have different assets like 
online and offline services that you can combine nicely to really win the impatient consumer for your products and for your offers. And with that, I say thank you all and back over to you, Laurie. Thank you so much, uh, Micah. And don't go too far because, uh, of course, we'll have you back for the, the Q&A session uh, toward the end. Uh, but at this time, I would like to bring on our uh, second speaker, Chavi Esplugas. VP IT Planning and Architecture, DHL Supply Chain. And uh, since joining DHL in 2012, Shavi has served in different roles, driving the standardization and innovation agenda in Europe, such as DHL's vision picking, robotics, and the Internet of Things. Shavi has an MSc from UPC in Barcelona, and he is based out of the DHL headquarters in Bonn, Germany. So it's great to have you on today, and over to you, Shavi. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your for your intro, Lori. Uh, and also, I would like to thank uh, Michael for for explaining uh, the, the new landscape of e-commerce. What we are seeing is that as the digital technologies are introducing these new capabilities, um, and of course, also together some some new limitations, there is an increasing role on this technology as well uh, and this centricity when it comes to the purchasing decisions. Uh, the, the three points that Maika has identified are, are fully consistent with, with the findings that DHL supply chain uh, got in this uh, late 2017 digitalization uh, research report. But we see that the big data and the analytics is becoming as one of the technologies which is having the most significant effect in supply chains. Over the next minutes, uh, I would like to, to, to highlight how companies, and specifically DHL, is, is tackling such a challenge and how can you transform your supply chain operations in order to satisfy those super empowered customers. So if you have got those super empowered customers, you'll definitely need to be able to super power your supply chain using the data to put the customer or the user first leverage the technology to be assistive, smart, and fast, and as well to provide those integrated services for that truly omnichannel experience. The first thing that we need to take into account is that the whole th scope is bigger than what we think. Uh, whenever we see about, uh, we say about e-commerce, uh, everybody's come to their mind, uh, B2C and the big players uh, today playing on the on e-commerce. But what is less obvious and what is actually happening is that some of the behaviors that the consumers are having on their B2C, they are starting to apply that on the B2B market as well. So anybody like you and I, we might be going to a, an online retailer over the weekend doing our shopping for shoes or some electricity, the kind of experience seamless using your mobile, um, easy to order, easy to find, easy to compare, when you get back to your office, probably on Monday or Tuesday, and perhaps you have to make some, some sort of like purchasing decision, you would like to have at your fingertips the possibility of having that marketplace or, or those references, or you would like to know whether in a certain sector a certain uh, provider is trustworthy or not. So they are bringing their, this customer experience is now coming to the B2C. We are seeing in some studies that, for example, in, in the States, 13% uh, 13, 13 of all the B2B sales will be carried out online in 2021. So here the learning is we are actually in the B2B business, we are somehow a decade behind of what was happening in the B2C. So the disruption that we have seen for the last 10 years on the consumer space, it's likely to happen as well in the business to business space as well. And of course that will drive different changes uh, because for the, those of you who are in the B2B sectors and if you had the opportunity to, to work on a warehouse, uh, in a B2B, and you look at what a warehouse on a business to consumer, more like omni-channel warehouse is about, you will see clear differences. On one side, you will need more employees because you will be picking more individual orders. The whole ordering process is much more tailored. It's very likely you will see them working with carts rather than having machinery to pick the orders. Um, you will not have, you will not see as many forklifts. The aisles are gonna be more narrow the shelving is not as high. The space is still in the warehousing space is increasingly and becoming more expensive. So you also need to deploy the right picking approach. 
having more um, people on the ground with picking more orders, there is of course congestion related risk to that uh, situation. So you have you will have to continuously optimize uh, your picking strategy. What we are seeing is that of course you need to get assisted by new technologies and of course increasingly some robotic technologies or, or autonomous vehicles they are complementing the work of, of those speakers. They can transport the orders from one part of the warehouse to the other without that manual intervention. And back again to the to the webinar that was shared in uh, in March that was specifically more about the focus uh, that my colleague Adrian was bringing on that smart warehouse of how the true warehouse changes on its uh, on its approach in order to be able to fulfill the the needs of of an e-commerce setup. If we look then at the usage of the data in terms of like how we can apply the big data to know more about the consumer that that Michael was referring to and, and we are facing every day, there are really things that of course are in your interest and your customer's interest for you to stay in the game. The first one is having better quality of who is buying your products will help you keep your prices down. So you will be able to keep uh, your overhead somehow minimized for the cost of savings because you will have better inventory forecasting, you will be able to, to better optimize your staffing levels, and of course you can improve as well your, your space and, and the equipment. It is also important to be aware that you need to provide that flexibility. The omnichannel capabilities are gonna be there and you will see that there are certain patterns and behaviors, namely, for example, people doing online shopping over the weekend will, of course, drive a, a very hurry Monday, so there will be a lot of peaks in the Mondays. This consumer, when they get into the office, they're uh, starting a week, they will, of course, focus on their job, and perhaps they will not have time to look and, and do perhaps some personal stuff, so you will also expect that they will not do so much online personal shopping on that Monday, so your picking that happens the day after on, on Tuesday, you know it's going to be reduced. So beyond the seasonality that we used to see weeks to weeks or months to months, the omnichannel fulfillment and e-commerce fulfillment now is bringing seasonality even within the weekdays. And of course, what is important is to think about that 24-hour availability. <laughs> That's uh, you need to. You are going to have your shop up and running for 24 hours, and of course, you want that uh, your logistics supply chain follows behind on, on that setup. And last but not least, all in all, uh, it's uh, summarized as a better experience. So you definitely don't want to have any out of stock or missed uh, availability. You want to fulfill as fast as you can and uh, start thinking about that anticipatory, anticipatory uh, buying recommendations. On that topic, I would like to highlight, for example, one pilot we are doing with a fast moving consumer goods. Um, they do have their forecast model and in a collaborative co-creation uh, work together with us we are sharing their forecast models we also can bring our forecast models DHL has strong view on, on the e-commerce trend and also the, the global trading the customer can offer the input data that they have got from the TV ads that they are running they can look also at the at the historical volumes the combination of the different sources of data to create a unique model gives them better forecasting for them, which of course is helping us as their logistics provider to deliver the, the results. So now that we have seen how we can apply that somehow big data, I want to bring also here the point about what is the specific knowledge that a third party or the logistics supply chain you can also get in order to know better your customer. The, the 3PLs, we of course will be able to provide you information around the delivery time chosen by your customers, both B2B, B2C, the resource utilization and the geographical uh, coverage. We are able to combine analytics with also specific knowledge about risks, providing resilience. Uh, DHL in this case, we are pretty much scattered um, all over the globe, so we do have people on the field uh, and we you can get that local knowledge and contact to understand whether a certain delivery is going to take two days or it's going to take three days, that team specifically in the field will be able to, to feed that information back to you. And last but not least, of course, that network provides a constant flow of goods, demographics. We also see those, those high macro patterns um, changing and we can feed back that to you. I would like also to refer about one, one figure which was pretty impressive 
on that study, which is 73% of those companies, they they really feel that the most significant information technology is uh, that that data is is one of their most important assets for for them. How you can make that data meaningful? Because one thing is collecting data, and another thing is getting knowledge and getting insights. The very first thing that is important to understand is that you need consistency. You need somehow consistent processes. You need some constant, cons consistent measurements. And that's the best way when you come to an omni-channel because the different channels, what you're just, you have to think about them. That is just your single way to reach out to your customers. Yes, you will reach them in different ways, you know, in a sense of different, um, different paths. But you are treating usually with just one single customer and what you want is just to get your products uh, to them. If somebody is interested into getting a bit of more insight, also another arm of, of DHL, DHL Consulting, they, they develop a strategic framework for omnichannel supply chains. Uh, I'm sure you can also, it's also available for download if you can look for it. Uh, that strategic framework for omnichannel design, it, it's going to give a certain uh, hints and I would like to cover a couple of topics on the on the next slide about what it really means on designing an omnichannel strategy. The very first question you have to ask is around the product offering by channel. Are you going to have products which are unique to your online ch sales channel? Are you going to be offering exactly the same? Is the target that you want to address from a customer's perspective the same or not? Second, second topic is around inventory management. Are you going to have a segregated inventory, things that are going to only going to serve your orders in the B2C, or are you going to also use that inventory for your B2B business? If you have got your, your product palletized and you take one case out of one pallet, you are just breaking that pallet. As a result of that, the whole does the whole pallet then go and it's only available for B2C or will you be able to recompose? There is not right or wrong answer, it, it really makes, uh, it, you have to understand what is going to be the needs of your customers, of course, the, the inventory levels that you're going to use. And depending on one or the other, you choose one option or the other. It also comes around the delivery options. So how you want your customers to receive those products and what are also the other costs. Uh, the fulfillment and the storage. Where do you intend to store those, those products? You can have regional distribution centers, unique per region. You can have distributed one per country. You can have a full distributed inventory setup where you have got, if you have got shops or you have got um, work areas where you can just get these uh, these goods closer to the customer. Understanding that fulfillment is going to become one of the critical part, and you want to be as close as possible to your customers. You will also have to define on that strategy around the balancing of that proximity versus the cost. You also have got the final mile delivery. What's going to be the very last, uh, how you're going to offer on, on those channels? Are you going to offer as well this 24-7? Are you going to offer just a reduced time set? The return options. The customer, when it buys something, uh, pretty much uh, executes the, the, the credit card transaction fee. Um, whenever the customer is returning something, you want uh, probably the cust as a customer you want to receive that money back uh, as soon as possible. Are you going to trust your 3PL so they do the, the validity check and then yes you confirm back to your customers? Are you going to have those distributed centers when they're going to do the validations? Are you going to ship all of them into one location? Again, there is not right or wrong. It definitely depends on, on the profile of how you're going to design those new supply chains in order to fulfill the, uh, the omni-channel. And that return handling. Sometimes uh, some of the goods definitely require some, some specific handling. Um, we know that batteries from a center, certain size cannot be just easily shipped. So there is a whole consideration on, on that. If all those aspects sound complicated, the truth is that it really is. And, and having an omnichannel strategy, it, it does require some, some specific thinking and understanding to go ahead with, with that strategy, the best, the best thing you can do is, is to make a, a really good use of the data. So all in all, and just to finish, if we are going to face now, and we are starting to face now, super empowered consumers, thanks to the technology that they have got at their hands, uh, you need to superpower your supply chain. So make sure you use the data to then put your user first. It will help you creeping your price down. 
It, of course, increases uh, the availability of your orders. It will offer better flexibility. Make sure you leverage the, the technology that is already, already there and will make you smarter and will make you deliver faster. Start thinking about anticipatory needs and automate some of the tasks. And again, if there is a highlight to think about is think about the disruption that is happening in the B2C. It's, it's, it's clearly coming to the B2B and we've seen the first waves of that. And last but not least, uh, provide that integrated service and an integrated experience. So you have to ensure the consistency across the channels. And in that case, the best way to do is just to think about that big micro channel that is just a single one channel while you have got different ways to reach your customer. And that was up for me. So thank you very much. And back to you, Laurie. All right. Thank you so much, Xavi. And uh, we'll give you a moment to catch your breath and get a sip of water before we invite uh, both you and Micah back up to uh, answer some of the questions that are coming through the queue. And um, folks, uh, at this point, I would like to put up a, a second poll question before we get to that, uh, that Q&A. So coming up on the screen there um, is the question. Now that you've heard from our speakers, uh, Micah and Chabi, uh, what are your strategies for digitalization success? So uh, in this case, we're uh, asking that you select your top two. Um, it's on the honor system. You, of course, can select more than that. But uh, looking for your top two, conducting more research to quantify value before proceeding, developing supply chain digitalization strategy, developing operationally specific strategies, collaborating with external partners, or piloting technologies. Looks pretty even across the board, but uh, we've got 37% conducting uh, more research to, um, uh, to quantify value before proceeding, and we have 48% developing uh, supply chain digitalization uh, strategies then 45% developing uh, operationally specific strategies, 28% collaborating with external partners, 34% piloting technologies. Um, I think it just says that uh, um, everybody is uh, kind of moving along this, uh, this journey. So appreciate your input here and uh, wanted to take a moment to share with you some next steps if you'd like uh, some additional information or just to continue the conversation. I wanted to remind you that a link to the recording of the March 21st webinar uh, that I referred to at the outset of today's webinar, a Smart Warehouse Practical Guide for Digital Advantage, a uh, link will be sent out along with a link for today's webinar. So you'll have uh, both of those available to you. Uh, to access additional digitalization resources related to implementing uh, physical warehouse technologies, uh, there will be some links included as well in that follow-up email and uh, information on how to set up a one-on-one -on -one discussion with a supply chain digitalization expert. So please keep an eye out for that follow-up email with all of this information, um, likely to come out early uh, next week. Um, and at this time, I would like to invite both uh, Micah and Chavi back to the virtual podium. And I'm uh, going to go ahead and start with some of the questions here in the queue. Um, some of these questions came in uh, pre-webinar and some uh, during the the event right now. So I'll go ahead and start with uh, you, Chavi. Uh, with limited budget, where do you see potential for the biggest ROI for digital supply chain technologies? You said limited budget, right? Not unlimited. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. Yeah. Okay, so with, with, with limited budget, I think you have perhaps to, to split uh, your digitalization strategy into. One is, uh, of course, should be addressing the short gains, uh, which might be around um, small efficiencies that you can run in your warehouse. And you referred again about that, that smart warehouse. So perhaps bring in the combination of perhaps some, some certain robotics or, or new technology. There are things which are pretty much plug and play. You can you can get those, those digitalization top, um, assets um, right to your warehouse almost uh, immediately. But this is not where the big wins are. The big wins are coming on a, on a more of a strategy on the long term, which I guess, um, or at least was addressing the the, the previous slides, where thinking about an internal strategy and getting it right will, of course, that you potentially have to change some of some of your processes. But uh, but clearly, 
if the processes allow you to gather better insights of what the customers want, that will help you targeting significantly better your, your customers. All right, thank you. Uh, moving over to you, Micah. Uh, are there lessons that businesses can adopt from Google to better anticipate changes in buying behavior? And I like that question, Laurie. It's um, so. It is. It is a very. It is a very broad question. And so, so my reply to that is that every business is very different, and probably also operating in a very different environment than the environment that we are operating in. But um, here are a few points that I usually bring up when talking to our clients directly, which are retailers. So I think, and that's also something that, that Google does, is um, I think that point number one is always to be aware about opportunities and be aware about changes going on. And I think that things like this webinar, you know, such events are very, very important because um, people get into conversations with each other. Um, Number two is then really be very open for new changes and stay curious. So um, I, I actually like the answer that was just given that uh, quite a few of uh, the people listening to this webinar said, I, I need to invest more into pilots. Um, I think this is a very good way because um, we're still at the very beginning of the age of assistance, very early days right now. And I think experiments are extremely important and testing new things. And don't expect to launch something that is super perfect because this will not happen. So launching, testing, and then adjusting and launching again, iterating. I think this is, this is the right way to do it. Um, and this is definitely also a way that how, how Google brings new products into the market. We're doing a lot of testing you know, we're doing, we're applying a lot of changes usually um, before a product actually gets, goes live and is fully launched across all the markets. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, this one for you, Chavi, and uh, I'm interested in the answer as well. Uh, how long until AI is applied to supply chains to reduce delivery lead times to customers? <laughs> Thanks, Laurie, for the question. Um, Actually, the, it is quite a relevant question, and uh, DHL precisely this week has, has released a trend research report on the use of AI in applied in logistics. And the trend report shares about uh, include about a few examples that that trend, re that trend research report has been done in collaboration with, with IBM, where we have collaborated into even the creation of, of one uh, proof of concept. In a shorter scale, I'll see this happening pretty much starting half of this year, beginning of next year. So I think that the, the, the proof of concept and some of the some of the AI models are are now ready to be starting playing with them. On a massive scale, probably 2019, 2020 timeframe, it's it's for sure. And I'm truly believer that if I look in a in a long long time frame, probably in 2025. Uh, there will be no manual scheduling of, of, of such such a work in terms of like from from the supply chain because the the computer with their power would have outgrown uh, the human capacity to produce those models. We we have seen um, computers actually <laughs> Google's uh, DeepMind winning. Uh, they started winning uh, games like chess. Now they are winning games like Go, which are significantly more complex. This, this is, there is definitely it's a really, really, really focused technology that is going to ch significantly change for good supply chains. Okay. And on that one, yeah, I would like even to to invite uh, to Micah. I mean, if you want to add something on that topic, I think it. it I think there are a lot of opportunities, especially when we're talking about um, the topic omnichannel, right? I think. Um, that the age of assistance offers everyone uh, new opportunities to test out 
ways how to bring existing assets with new assets together. And uh, I just I just really think that using data in a smart way and fully understand of what do we have already and what can we put together and where can we uh, use synergies that we already have as a company internally um, between different departments, between different uh, business areas and bring that together. I think this really brings a lot of opportunities for uh, all the companies who are ready to take on new opportunities. I think uh, there needs to be a certain mindset for that within the company to actually you know, go in, be curious, test it, and see how it goes. Okay, Mike, I've got a, a question here for you uh, yeah. from Alejandro. From Alejandro. Um, what are the differences between uh, different geographies, Asia, Europe, Africa, Latin America, etc., regarding consumer trends mentioned in uh, Google intervention? Mm -hmm. So, if I understand this question correctly, um, this is about what are the differences between those geographies, or do we see differences between those geographies, correct? Regarding consumer trends. Mm -hmm. Yes, regarding consumer trends. Um, I think that is a tricky one because there might be differences between different sectors or industries. So it might be there might be different consumer trends depending on the product people are searching for. Uh, I would not be able to, to differentiate that uh, here, but I can definitely look into that afterwards. Um, so I think even within the region, we already see small differences between markets. For example, the Scandinavian markets, they are already for many years, they have been heavy mobile users, mobile device users, already also using it heavily for e-commerce, but other markets might be slightly slower. And there have been many studies going on in, in the markets um, by many different research institutes. Um, however, I think the trends between the different geographies are actually not that different when we look at the consumers. There might be a time delay, and that, that's my opinion to that. So some markets might be a bit further ahead of other markets. Um, but this also offers great opportunities for companies. For example, the Asian markets are markets where consumers um, have a very high uh, adoption rate already of mobile devices. And they're using it in very different ways than in other regions. And also businesses are using mobile devices and mobile services in a often in a different way than in other markets. So I think this offers great opportunities for uh, a company who's operating globally to take learnings from one region and try it out in other regions and see how it goes. But uh, I wouldn't say that from my perspective uh, there are massive differences. There might be a time delay in adoption. Mm. Okay. Um. Over to you, Chavi. A uh, question mm -hmm. here from uh, Joachim. Not sure if I've got that pronunciation uh, down, but uh, the question, is it only speed deliveries that has increased, not the flexibility of delivering, for example, home, work, or service points? That's actually a, a very good question. As, as you develop your own channel strategy, makes uh, and perhaps what you're doing is moving from one cut of time that you used to have every order before uh, entering the system before six would be then delivered the, the day after. Now you go perhaps to a, a constant model where you have got four or five different cutoff times. There is no point on then rushing parcels out in the last mile and then the delivery man rings at the door and nobody's at home. <laughs> and then tries again the next day or perhaps with another failed delivery and at the end it goes to a, to a center, a service center. That's that's definitely a scenario which is not convenient for the user and it's not desirable for, for DHL because, of course, we will also run into, into, I would say, additional costs. In order to tackle those things, uh, for, there are a few examples how, how we try to, to minimize these disruptions. And 
an interesting example is also a pilot uh, we, we co-created together with Tamblr, which is the delivery of certain parcels into the trunk of the car. So if you are, if you are a smart user, uh, owner, and uh, you are living in a big city in Germany, you can actually put a device on your car and the DHL man has got an application they know exactly where your car was parked. Being a smart, the likelihood that it's parked on the street is high, or very high. Addresses a very targeted uh, segment of consumers, uh, city users. So they know exactly where your car is, and that would include that information within their run, and you would get an SMS saying, DHL is just in front of about to deliver. Do you give them access to your door, to your car? They press the button, and then you get the, the, the delivery man gets around 20 seconds to, to open the trunk one time only, put the parcels, closes, and it's super convenient because you just finish work, you get in your car, you have your parcel being delivered. There is an other example, such as, for example, the increasing use of parcel lockers. So in, in, we call them, they are pack stations. We have no more than 2,000 uh, scattered also in Germany and many other countries. And again, it, it's a really valid point. It's not about getting things out of your shipping docks as soon as possible. It's just about to get them into the hands of the consumers as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. Um, now over to you, Micah. Uh, Vlad's asking, what can Google teach us about having the right mindset for digitalization? Okay, <laughs> this is almost a philosophical <laughs> question, I would say. <laughs> so, hmm, what can Google teach us? Um, I, 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 seriously, I uh, don't know if we are in the role to uh, teach everyone in digitalization. Obviously, and because we are uh, a digital company working on a lot of these technologies, we are constantly in conversations with all kinds of companies about digitalization. And we are discussing um, individual solutions and we, we try to be uh, a partner all t at all times whenever a company comes to us and asks us for an opinion or, for, uh, or asks us a question. We, we, we stay in the dialogue and I think this is something that is actually uh, helping us to learn about the different markets and about our partners out there. Um, so I think it is important to stay in touch and to stay in a, in a dialogue and to learn from each other and to ask questions to each other. And it's not that, you know, here's a blueprint that we have, let's do it that way. I think that obviously that wouldn't work. Um, what we do actually, and this might be a good hint, and we can include uh, this link in, in the email or in, in the resources center that you will be sharing afterwards, is Google has uh, a, a platform which is called Think with Google, and it's available for all markets internationally. And there we try to share case studies, for example, other companies' stories who say, here's, here's a story about digitalization and how we did it, you know, let's share it with the rest of the world. And this might be a good resource of inspiration for, for a few of you. And I'm very happy to share the links with you and then um, just have a read through it and see if you can find an inspiration or, uh, yeah another company's example that might be close to your own industry and close to your own company. All right, sounds fantastic. <clears throat> um, looks like we have time for one final question here. I'm going to send this one over to you, Chavi. Mm -hmm. um, how, are, how are platforms evolving to accommodate the volume of data that will be exchanged between companies, customers, and suppliers? Oof, okay. Uh, well, I think honestly that um, the cloud has changed the game uh, quite significantly. In the past, uh, storing data was super expensive, but today we have got plenty of providers which are which are providing uh, cloud services, Google Google itself, and uh, and that offers you an unprecedented scalability and unexchanged data. Moving it, of course, to next steps, there will be ideas around uh, cross sharing uh, together with 
privacy and so on and things like blockchain comes into play. Uh, again, we we delivered recently a, a study on blockchain and logistics uh, published together with Accenture. So I think the the platforms are no longer an excuse. If you want to deliver and you want to create something, they are up ready. You can have you can find them and you can have them at hand. All right. Well, thank you so much. And it uh, looks like we are uh, just hitting the top of the hour here. So um, before we sign off would certainly like to thank each of you for joining us and trust that you found today to be of value. Special thanks for our presenters today, uh, Micah Schnell and Chavi Esplugas. Of course, uh, thanks to our sponsor, DHL. Most importantly, again, thanks for joining. And this is Lori Dearman saying, hope we see you on the next one and have a great rest of your week. Bye for now.